there's something that happens in the lagoon when the whalers start to come. All the wildlife gets quiet. You'd hear breathing. You hear that sound echoing throughout this cove. And I was scared and shaking. I thought, well, if there is a God, let these last breaths not be in vain. There's no shortage of bad guys in this movie. The more you know, the bigger the bad guys get. You know, if you're really looking at the big picture, we're all kind of the bad guys. We're doing what no other wild animal will do and that's follow its own nest. We're all responsible for toxifying the oceans. They're the primary source of life on the planet and it's changing rapidly. I've always been interested in the oceans. I think it's from the very first Jacques Cousteau special I saw as a kid. I've been a diver for about 35 years. I've seen the state of the oceans decline within my generation. Our mission at the Oceanic Preservation Society is to, to create awareness about ocean degradation. It's a big, huge mission. It's almost an impossible mission, but if we don't do it, I don't know who else is out there gonna do it. We were trying to make the most beautiful film we could ever make about several issues, you know, dolphins, whales, the oceans, the beauty of the oceans, the coral reefs. And after we met Rick, you know, we really became focused on the cove. This is the largest slaughter of dolphins in the world, a systematic, deliberate cover-up, a, a media blackout. The, the dolphin meat is heavily laced with mercury. The way to stop it is to expose it. We are going to stop this. We are going to stop this. When we started this, we never expected to be part of the story. Then again, I never expected to find mercury in my blood. There was a big outbreak of mercury poisoning in Minamata, Japan, back in the 1950s. That's where mercury poisoning was first discovered. They call it uh, Minamata disease. The children were starting to be born deformed. And the government knows this, and the government's covering this up. Today, that's the primary place where they study the effects of mercury poisoning but none of the doctors were willing to go on camera. They get their research money from the government, and they're scared. I took the doctors out for sushi, and this is at a lunch, and there's about six or seven doctors, researchers, and, and scientists there, and none of them, not one of them, ate sushi, ate the fish. I thought, what's going on here? And I, I told, asked one of the guys, I said, well, why don't you eat fish? He says, you eat a lot of fish? I said, all the time. I, you know, only healthy fish like tuna. And they, said, they all laughed at me. And they said, you should really get your, your levels checked because uh, we don't eat anymore. And I'll tell you why. So one of the guys at the table did a Japanese equivalent of supersize me, they said. They were trying to figure out how fast mercury bile accumulates in the human body. So they each ate 200 grams of tuna every day for 30 days. After two weeks, their mercury levels had doubled. And they all thought, oh, finally, you know, we can get, eat, you know, we'll be safe, we won't have any, you know, mercury won't build up as much. And the net result was they were into the level of Minamata victims pretty quickly. They realized that if they kept it up, they would be like the victims that they were studying. So the smart money, the smart money in Japan is no longer eating apex predators like, like tuna, you know, the things that we love to eat. 
used to be a vegetarian in the sense I didn't eat you know, animals that walked. I used to be, you know, eat a lot of fish. I had the highest mercury level my doctor had ever seen in Colorado. It was about 40 parts per million in, in my blood, which is about the beginning of a mid-level minimata victim. When I asked the doctor, what's it mean to have mercury poisoning? And he said, it slowly takes away what it means to be human. The symptoms are memory loss, uh, loss of hearing, loss of your eyesight. It doesn't just knock you over dead, it takes a while. The cove definitely changed my eating habits. Now I can't eat large fish at all anymore. What's taking place in Taiji is a microcosm of what's taking place all over the planet. This is a worldwide problem. There is ancient law, it goes back to Roman times, it's called the public trust doctrine. It says those things that are not susceptible to private ownership, but by their nature are the property of the whole community, the running waters, the air, um, the wandering animals, the public lands, the fisheries, that everybody has a right to use them. Whether you're rich or poor, or humble or noble, black or white, every child has the right to go down to their local waterway, pull out a fish and come home and feed it to their family with the security that they're not poisoning somebody. I buy a fishing license every year for $30. I get with it a fish advisory that's now about that thick. And that fish advisory tells me all of the fisheries in New York State, every waterway that has fish advisories, in other words, every waterway in which the fish are no longer safe to eat. We're living today in a science fiction nightmare in this country. The mercury primarily is coming from about 900 coal-burning power plants that are discharging it into the air, and it's falling on our waterways. There are 19 states, according to EPA, in which every freshwater fish is now unsafe to eat. There are 49 states where at least some, although not quite all, of the fish are unsafe to eat. In fact, the only state where all the fish are safe to eat is Dick Cheney's home state of Wyoming, which is a big coal state, where the Republican-controlled legislature has refused to appropriate the money to test the fish. You're gonna see it all along the east and west coast, in the Gulf of Mexico, all around Texas, Alabama, uh, in Hawaii, you know, those kind of places that, that eat a lot of fish, that's where you're gonna see the problem. People who are more affluent tend to consume the larger predators. They don't like bones in their fish. They don't like fishy flavor. They're not deterred by the price. Therefore, the seafood combo for them is not deep fried cod, clam chowder, and shrimp. It's actually ahi, sea bass, and swordfish, which could be hundreds of times higher in mercury levels. The predatory fish eat a lot of other fish, they live a long time, and they cannot rid themselves of mercury. Therefore, it amplifies by hundreds to thousands of times as it goes up the food chain. Unlike other toxicants, which will reduce in the food chain, this is one that strongly adheres to their tissues. It's in the muscle, so you can't cook it out of the fish. The way I came upon this was by pure serendipity. A patient of mine came in for hair loss and had other nonspecific symptoms. The patient had high mercury. So I thought, wow, we have a lot of people that eat fish the way she was consuming it. Is it a particular restaurant? Is it just the Bay Area? And after that, I found out that this was a worldwide problem. The EPA, you know, Environmental Protection Agency, just did a test of fish from all over the country. And they said only 25% of it was above its levels for toxicity. One in four fish was too toxic to eat. Our pollution, such as coal-fired power plants, chloralkali plants, and other industrial waste has greatly increased mercury available for consumption of organisms. There's always an argument by the industry to say that there isn't an increase. They say that mercury is natural because the laws protect them better if they can say that it's not caused by humans and it's natural. 
But to a physician, I don't care if it was there man-made or natural. It's going to be the same in my office. You have mercury and you have poison. If you eat poison, you don't feel well, stop eating poison and see if you feel better. What we found in Japan was that they don't have this choice. Half the time, they don't even know what they're eating. The Taiji dolphin hunters started giving the dolphin meat away free to the school system. They're not being told that the free lunch meat that their children are getting are contaminated with high levels of mercury. Two city council members came out on record. They risked their, if not their lives, their livelihood to speak out. We have our own mercury problem in the United States. What I've learned is that it takes people who are willing to stand up and speak out and not give up when you see a blatant wrong. According to EPA and other government health agencies, there are 640,000 children born in this country every year who've been exposed to dangerous levels of mercury in their mother's wombs. Millions more have been exposed to mercury in their first few months of life through a preservative called thimerosal. We know that mercury is a very potent neurotoxin and that it destroys brain tissue in rats, in goats, in sheep, in cows. So why would you put a brain poison in a little kid unless you knew it was safe? Centuries ago, mercury was used in making gold and silver. Making gold out of rock was just so, uh, so fantastic, it was like magic. The fluids that came off of that were considered the elixir of life. And if you drank that, you would be, uh, you'd be a person that lived forever. So that's how that idea came about. Many of these products were before the 1920s including ethyl mercury that's put in vaccines. It never went through safety and efficacy studies uh, the way it should have. In fact, it wasn't until 1998 that uh, mercurial products over the counter were removed. The Clinton administration, recognizing the gravity of this national health epidemic, reclassified mercury as a hazardous pollutant under the Clean Air Act. Despite that, Thimerosal remains in use today. When I was a little boy, I received three vaccines. The children who were born after 1989 received 22 vaccines, and there was never any kind of analysis done on what the mass loading of mercury might be doing to the child's brain tissue or future growth. The generation of children who were born after 1989 are the sickest generation in the history of our country. Diabetes, asthma, which was you know virtually unknown when I was a kid, food allergies, ADD, hyperactivity disorder, tics, all kinds of um, learning delays, speech delays, and of course autism. Since 1989, the reported cases of autism and autistic symptoms have skyrocketed. Nobody knows what's causing the autism epidemic. The occurrence of autism was about 1 in 10,000 during the early 1960s, for example. By 1980s, the best data show that it was about 1 in 2,500 kids were born with autism. Today, the data show that about one in every 157 children have autism, and perhaps as high as one in every 80 boys. One of the reasons given by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention is that we are now better at diagnosing autism. Well, this, of course, is nonsense, because missing autism is like missing a train wreck. I mean, the ultimate answer is, if this is just an artifact of better data collection, then where are all the 30-year-old autistics? They don't exist. Clearly, this is a specious argument, and yet they embrace it, and they broadcast that to the public. There's about 13 studies that the CDC now cites and relies on um, to say that there's no proven correlation between autism and mercury in vaccines. Every one of those studies either doesn't say that or they're seriously flawed.
There's a real problem with the influences of the researchers paid by industry. So much of the studies that show that mercury is not harmful are really influenced by those studies that are funded by uh, competing interests. Why don't we look at the American cohorts who did not receive the vaccines, like the Amish? Well, the CDC has cut off all funding for those kind of studies. The Amish don't believe in vaccinations. Incidents of autism among the Amish are almost non-existent. That CDC ought to be opening every door, lifting every rug, and, and funding every study to make sure it doesn't exist. Instead of that, CDC is doing everything in its power to make sure that people don't study this independently. And not only that, that people continue to get mercury in their vaccines. One thing that people have to understand is that there's never been a blinded, placebo-controlled trial of giving methylmercury to humans to see what happens. Uh, so that's a problem in itself. If you tried to get one of those studies passed, the institution review boards and ethics committees probably wouldn't allow you to. But you can go to the grocery store and eat all you want without warning and without form, informed consent. Vaccines have saved the lives of probably tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people around the globe. Um, I am pro-vaccine, um, but I'm pro-truth, I think, and I'm pro-science. And I think that the agencies have to come clean with the American public. You know, the tobacco industry succeeded for 60 years. This is an industry that was killing one out of every five of its clients who used its product as directed and yet it was able to escape any legal consequences for its negligence. The cigarette industry at least had the CDC and the Surgeon General against it. Well imagine if the, the conspiracy, I'm going to call it a conspiracy, but it's out in the open, the conspiracy included CDC. The more you know, the bigger the bad guys get. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The story that Rick showed me at the beginning is just the tip of the iceberg.